So welcome to Unit 13, Treatment of Abnormal Behavior. This is Module 71, Behavior, Cognitive, and Group Therapies. And if you're just joining this uh, playlist on my channel, these slides in the AP Psychology playlist go along with Meyer Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition textbook. So there are four learning targets. It's a fairly long module. The first is to analyze how the basic assumption of behavior therapy differs from the assumptions of psychodynamic and humanistic therapies and to examine the techniques used in exposure therapies and aversive conditioning. To describe the main premise of therapy based on operant conditioning principle, you should be thinking back to some of the stuff we've learned about B.F. Skinner and contrast the views of its proponents and critics. Um, then to discuss, sorry about that. Barking dogs. Okay. Discuss the goals and techniques of the cognitive therapies and of cognitive behavioral therapy. And then finally discuss the aims and benefits of group therapy and family therapy. So how do behavior therapy, how does behavior therapy differ from what we talked about in the previous module, psychodynamic and humanistic therapies, those insight therapies? Well, the psychodynamic and humanistic, humanistic therapies expect people's problems to diminish as they gain insight into their unresolved and unconscious tensions, and as people get in touch with their feelings. So for behavior therapy, rather than delving deeply below the surface, looking for the inner causes, behavioral therapists assume that problems, the problem behaviors are the problems. If maladaptive symptoms are learned behaviors, why not apply those learning principles we know from operant conditioning uh, to replace them with new constructive behaviors? So what's an example? How can maladaptive behaviors be learned? As Pavlov and others showed, if we think back to our earlier modules in the learning uh, unit, we learn various behaviors and emotions through classical conditioning. If we're attacked by a dog, we may thereafter have a conditioned involuntary fear response when other dogs approach. Our fear generalizes and then all dogs become the conditioned stimuli. So if phobias, anxiety, and perhaps even depression can be learned, can they be unlearned? What is counter conditioning? Behavior therapy procedures that use classical conditioning to evoke new responses to stimuli that are triggering unwanted behaviors. It includes exposure therapies and aversive conditioning. Pairing the fear provoking stimulus with new positive responses can actually change behavior. So exposure therapies are behavioral techniques such as systematic desensitization and virtual reality exposure ther therapy. They treat anxieties by exposing people in either an imaginary or in an actual situation to the, <laughs> to the things they fear and avoid. These therapies in a variety of ways try to change people's reactions by repeatedly exposing them to stimuli that trigger unwanted reactions. With repeated exposure to what they normally avoid or escape, people tend to adapt. Systematic desensitization is a type of exposure therapy that associates a pleasant, relaxed state with gradually increasing anxiety triggering stimuli. So behavior therapists utilize this tool. They might have an anxious patient develop an anxiety hierarchy of stimuli that are causing fear and help the patient to work through each step of that hierarchy, getting closer and closer to the fear producing stimulus. At each level of the hierarchy, relaxation methods are practiced until the client as, is calm at that level of exposure. So for example, a person with a phobia of flying may first learn to relax when looking at airline sale ads in the paper, then learn to relax when driving by an airport. The therapist may then have the patient visit a museum of aircraft and work on relaxation techniques. At each new level or step of fear, a step of fear is mastered with relaxation, then the patient soon attempts to sit on a plane or fly on a, fly on a plane even. Virtual reality exposure therapy is a counter conditioning te technique that treats anxiety through creative electro electronic simulations in which people can safely face their greatest fears, such as um, airplane flying, uh, maybe spiders, or even public speaking. How does virtual reality therapy exposure work? As you can imagine, this is a rather new type of therapy. So safe in a room with a the therapist, the patient dons virtual reality goggles. You may have seen some, or you might even have been able to wear some. Um, lots of museums and stuff now are having virtual reality goggles. 
People see vivid simulations of feared stimuli, such as walking across a rickety bridge high off the ground. Oops, sorry about that. And they go through the same sort of steps that we just talked about in terms of exposure and talking through being uh, calmer in those situations and just, uh, it's, it's a way to experience that fear evoking stimulus in a much safer environment. What is aversive conditioning? It's a type of counter conditioning that associates an unpleasant state, such as nausea, with an unwanted behavior, such as drinking alcohol. Okay, so aversive conditioning procedure is simple. It associates the unwanted behavior with an unwanted, unpleasant feeling. So to treat nail biting, a therapist might suggest painting the fingernails with a nasty, tasty nail polish. So whenever the person goes to bite their fingernails, they taste something really, really gross. This often happens with um, treatment, not often, but this has, does happen with treatment for um, alcohol issues that people take certain drugs that um, certain medications that actually make you get sick if you then drink alcohol as a way to make alcohol an aversive uh, stimulus. So here's an example of that. So after repeatedly drinking alcohol mixed with a drug that produces severe nausea, some people with a history of alcohol use disorder develop at least a temporary conditioned aversion to the alcohol. Behavior modification is reinforcing behaviors considered desirable and failing to, to reinforce or even sometimes punishing behaviors considered un, undesirable. So let's think back to that operant conditioning, that Skinneri, those Skinnerian methods, right? If we want reinforce versus um, pun reinforcement versus punishment. So therapists utilizing this kind of behavior modification use these operant conditioning principles, such as giving positive reinforcement to shape wanted behavior and using punishment to decrease unwanted behavior. In a step-by-step -step manner, they, the rewarded, they are rewarded for behavior that is cl a closer approximation of the desired behavior. Um, so sort of step-by-step -step as uh, someone is moving from you know, toward the behavior that is wanted in the end, at each step of the way, they might get small little rewards until they get to that final desired behavior. So what research has been conducted on behavior modification? So one study worked with 19 withdrawn, uncommunicative three-year-olds with autism spectrum disorder. For two years, 40 hours each week, the children's parents attempted to shape their behavior. They positively reinforced desired behaviors and ignored or punished aggressive and self-abusive behaviors. So what did the results show? Well, the combination worked wonders for some children. By first grade, nine of the 19 were fu functioning successfully in school and exhibiting normal intelligence. In a group of 40 comparable uh, children, not undergoing this effortful treatment, only one showed similar improvement. So that's pretty good. What is a token economy? These kind of methods are actually often used in schools or in parent for parenting techniques. It's an operant conditioning procedure in which people earn a token, a chip, a stamp, or other non-monetary item, maybe a sticker or something like that, for exhibiting a desired behavior. Um, and then they can later exchange it for privileges or treats. So, you know, you earn, 10 tokens or 10 stickers, and then you can take it to the treasure box um, to get a treat or some sort of earn some sort of privilege. So another example, when people display a desired behavior, such as getting out of bed, washing, dressing, eating, talking coherently, cleaning up the rooms or so on, they can receive a plastic coin. Later, they can exchange a number of these tokens for re rewards, such as something they really want, like candy, TV time, um, or uh, other things that are desirable. Now, what are some criticisms of behavior modification? So how durable are the behaviors? Will people become so dependent? This is always the concern. Will people be so dependent on the extrinsic rewards that the desired behaviors will stop when the reinforcers stop? The other thing is, is it right for one human to control another human's behavior? Those who set up token economies deprive people of something they desire. And they get to decide what, which behaviors to reinforce. To critics of these, this, these behavioral modification techniques, the whole process feels authoritarian. Now, cognitive therapy, on the other hand, is therapy that teaches people new, more adaptive ways of thinking. It's based on the assumption that thoughts intervene between events and our emotional reactions. The cognitive therapies assume that our thinking colors our feelings. Between an event 
and our response lies our mind. Self-blaming and overgeneralized explanations of bad events feed our depression. Anxiety arises from an attention to bias threat. What is the cognitive perspective on psychological disorders? So the person's emotional reactions are produced not directly by the event, according to cognitive therapists, but the person's thoughts in response to the event. So you can see these two examples up here. Someone lost a job and the person at the top says, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, it's hopeless. That could potentially lead to depression. But the second person lost a job as well, but their internal beliefs are something more like, it wasn't a good fit anyway, I deserve something better. They would be much less likely to then develop depression. So rational behavior, rational emotive behavior therapy, in cognitive therapy we didn't mention, um, the father of that is sort of Aaron Beck, and rational emotive behavior therapy um, is Albert Ellis. Um, it's sort of a confrontational type of cognitive therapy developed by Ellis that vigorously challenges people's illogical, self-defeating attitudes and assumptions. According to Ellis, the creator of RABT, many problems arise from irrational thinking. So Aaron Beck, I just mentioned him, what has he contributed? So in the late 1960s, a woman left the party early. Things had not gone well. She felt disconnected from the other party goers and assumed no one cared for her. A few days later, she visited cognitive therapist Aaron Beck, who challenged her thinking. After she then listened to a dozen people who did care for her, Beck realized that challenging people's automatic negative thoughts could be therapeutic. This was kind of groundbreaking back then. Beck's cognitive therapy assumes that changing people's thinking can then change their functioning. Catastrophizing is an interesting technique that you know, some of us can maybe identify with. Perhaps you can. Perhaps you can identify with the anxious students who before a test make matters worse with saying things like, oh, this test is gonna be impossible. Everyone seems so relaxed and confident. I wish I were better prepared. I'm so nervous, I'll forget everything. Psychologists call this sort of relentless, overgeneralized, self-blaming behavior catastrophizing. Here are some, I'm gonna leave this up here, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but here are some cognitive therapy techniques. The aim of the tech, different techniques um, are on the left, the techniques themselves in the middle, and the therapist directives are on the right. And I'm gonna take a sip of water. Okay, so what is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT? It's a very popular therapy that combines cognitive therapy, changing those self-defeating thoughts with behavior therapy, changing that behavior, and it can be very, very effective. It takes a combined approach to depression and other disorders. This widely practiced sort of integrative therapy aims to alter not only the way people think, but also the way they act, their behaviors. So now, Switching gears a tiny bit, how do cognitive therapists help people with eating disorders? Cognitive therapists guide people toward new ways of explaining their good and bad experiences by recording positive events um, and how this woman has enabled them. This woman may be more mindful of her self-control and become more optimistic. Group therapy is often utilized in different situations. It's just basically what it sounds like, therapy conducted within groups rather than individuals. And it can provide a big benefit for group interaction for people that need, um, need to, to some extent to improve their ab abilities to function within a group. Family therapy is therapy that treats people in the context of how they fit into their family system and views an individual's unwanted behaviors as sort of influenced by and directed at other family members. So some benefits of group therapy could help more people and cost less per person than individual therapy. 
Um, you can learn that it can be really nice for some people to be able to learn that they're not alone, that the other people have similar problems. And you can also get feedback from others in the group on new ways of behaving. Family therapy can help family members identify their roles within their family's social system, can help improve communication within the family, and it can also lead to discovery of new ways of present, preventing or resolving conflicts. Self-help groups are all over the place. You guys have probably um, seen and heard about some or maybe even been a part of some. More than 100 million Americans have belonged to small religious interest or support groups that make, meet regularly with nine in 10 reporting that group members support each other emotionally. Uh, in an individualistic age, which some people say we really live in, with more and more people living alone or potentially feeling isolated, the popularity of support groups, and even some of these support groups now are virtual, for the addicted, the bereaved, the divorced, or some that just need some fellowship or growth, they may reflect sort of a longing for community and connectedness. So here's an overview. Again, I'm not going to read this whole chart. Comparing modern psychotherapies. I'll leave it up here for about a minute. Okay, we're back to the learning target reviews. Behavior therapies are not insight therapies. So they're not the same as like psychoanalytic, psychodynamic theory, uh, therapy and humanistic therapies. Their goal is to apply learning principles to modify the behaviors, the problem behaviors. Classical conditioning techniques include exposure therapies and aversive conditioning. Um, and they attempt to change behaviors through counter conditioning, evoking new responses to old stimuli that trigger unwanted behaviors. Therapy based on operant conditioning principles uses behavior modification techniques to change unwanted behaviors through those Skinnerian techniques of positive reinforcement and to ignore or punish undesirable behaviors. Critics um, of the behavioral therapies maintain that techniques such as those used in token economies may produce behavior changes that disappear when those extrinsic rewards are gone. And they also think that potentially deciding which behaviors should change for another person is authoritarian and unethical. Proponents argue that treatment with positive rewards is more humane than punishing people or institutionalizing them for undesired behaviors. The cognitive therapies, such as Aaron Beck's Cognitive Therapy for Depression, assume that our thinking influences our feelings and that the therapist's role is to change clients' self-defeating thinking by training them to perceive and interpret events in more constructive ways. REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, is a confrontational cognitive therapy that actively challenges irrational beliefs. And this was developed by Albert Ellis. The widely researched and practiced cognitive behavioral therapy, often shortened to CBT, combines cognitive therapy and behavior therapy by helping clients regularly try out their new ways of thinking and acting in everyday life. So we've also went over a little bit about group therapy and family therapy. Group sessions can help more people and cost less. That's a big benefit. Clients may benefit from exploring feelings and developing social skills and from learning that other people have similar problems and they might even get feedback from the group members and help on new ways of behaving. Family therapy views the family as an interactive system, sort of a systems approach to therapy. It attempts to help members discover the roles they play and learn to communicate more openly and directly. And that is our last slide. Thank you for listening. Take care.